But it was another experiment in the long line of experiments that the Rattle's done in exploring the best way to support the people that we really care about, which is the members, those artists, those inventors, those pioneers. Hey gang, welcome to Big Brother and the Hodling Company, a podcast about music and Web3 and trying to fend off Big Brother. I'm a Keegan Voice, and today I had a great conversation with John Eads, who spent close to seven years at the eminent Abbey Road Studios before co-founding The Rattle, which is an organization that's done everything from running physical spaces in London and LA to running a venture studio to launching their own tokenized network of supporters. We chatted about his journey and about how he got here from being a nerdy, dreadlocked teenager in suburban London who loved maths and manual labor and playing the trumpet. So I hope you all enjoy the conversation. Here we go. It's great to have you here, John. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. So yeah, I always like to start this thing from the beginning and just hear about your background, your roots, and where you're from, where you grew up, and how you first got involved with music. All right. I always try and avoid the the obvious. Like most people's stories, like mine, start with I played an instrument when I was a kid. I did <laughs> trumpet was my thing, and from there, it's not a particularly cool instrument. Yeah, I played in orchestras, played in big bands. I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong, but. It wasn't the uh, wasn't the thing that you were respected for or uh, <laughs> made popular for at school. But then started playing guitar a bit. Ended up playing in bands, that kind of thing. And yeah, that got me interested in recording and production technologies. I was fairly academic all the way through school. I found maths easy, which mm. I don't say to to try and be big headed. It just came naturally. I don't know why. And then you have physics and and music and combined all those together and found this course, which is what I ended up studying my undergraduate degree at Surrey University in the UK, which was a very academic take on the subject of music and audio engineering. So we learned all sorts of stuff. I'm talking the Red Book standard for CDs, the biology of the inner ear, the physics of room acoustics. The list really goes on, a bit of computer science. And uh, yeah, I that got me really interested in the technical underpinnings of the whole, I wouldn't have called it industry or market back then. I would have used other words, but I strayed away from the creative side into the technical side across my studies i actually ended up working across a summer vacation or a summer break as an electrician with an old friend of mine from back home and hmm. completely fell in love with manual labor if i'm honest and i still i uh, still spend my weekends renovating my house and it's not <laughs> a chore it's a joy and uh, put all that together and I did a, my placement year during that undergraduate degree at Abbey Road, which is a very well-known name. And I felt very lucky to be given the opportunity to work there. I actually worked across two places initially. There was another studio called Olympic Studios in Southwest London. Hmm. And I mentioned that because while I was working there, I was doing three weeks there, three weeks at Abbey Road, back and forth. But while I was working at Olympic, it shut down and I was working in a technical role, fixing things, recapping consoles, that sort of stuff. And that was a real eye opener for me. I hadn't until that point really considered the economic forces at work in the music hmm. business or the music industry, because I thought that studio was flourishing. You two were in for four weeks at the end. Pete Doherty was there. The Killers yeah. were recording. Like one of those kind of places, like whether you like those artists or not, it was a top tier studio. And then it shut and I was sent on a new course. I realized I didn't want to be so exposed, so vulnerable as a technical engineer, five layers removed from those economic forces. So <laughs> I went on a journey of discovery to try and understand yeah, the business. And 
my life since then has really been all of that stuff that I just described smushed together. So the technical interest, the commercial interest, and then obviously rooted in music. Cool. Taking one step back, I'm curious, as you're talking about the trumpet as a non-cool <laughs> instrument, <laughs> there's some pretty cool trumpeters out there. I'm curious why you picked the trumpet and one, if it related at all to your interest in math and you know, you know as well as physics and actually like really diving into how the instrument is used as a tool and, uh, and who are some of the trumpeters that perhaps inspired you to just start playing? Yeah, I, I wish there were really good romantic answers to those questions, but <laughs> really, at least in the British school system, you're not, as far as I can remember, given much of a choice. I think you're presented probably with a few different instruments, but I think you're more or less frog-marched into picking one of them. It wasn't like I had a period of three months of trying out drums and then clarinet or anything like that so I think I just that fell on my lap I don't think I, I don't remember it being a conscious choice and it certainly wasn't inspired by a love of trumpet this is when I was about maybe 10 years old or so I think it may have been earlier but I, I came from or come from a fairly relatively speaking musical family so all my brothers and sisters I have two brothers, two sisters, they all play instruments. We all learnt to the grade eight standard. So a fairly decent level of competency, a fairly early age. And uh, yeah, most of us still play in one, one respect or the other. So it was more a kind of, yeah, the, my family's culture of music being respected and enjoyed and being felt as something that all children should participate in. So it came from that angle rather than really a personal desire to pursue it. It became that over time, but that wasn't really the genesis. And yeah, the kind of physics and maths of how instruments work, that, that didn't click in for me until way later and into my late teens and maybe even early 20s. So sorry, that's not a <laughs> compelling romantic answer, but that's the truth. <laughs> no worries, I'd rather have the truth. I just thought maybe you were an aspiring Miles Davis or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, not really. And to be a jazz musician is, in my mind, quite a different discipline to what I majored in, which is more playing from score and playing right. large ensembles. I don't think I ever really had the confidence for it as a child, as a younger man. You're a, you're very exposed. You're a front person in some regard as mm. solo jazz player in well, certainly one of those instruments. And I never wanted that. I was fairly shy, fairly academic, fairly nerdy as a teenager. And to make matters worse or better, I had dreadlocks at the time. <laughs> And so it's a kind of a, um, an oddball, especially living in suburban southeast London. <laughs> and never really felt much of an affinity to, to people around me. And maybe I could have overcome that with just a massive bout of confidence. I guess I found that later on in life. But at that point, yeah, jazz just felt a petrifying idea. Whereas seeing behind a music stand, playing off a score and doing a decent job of it, that was something I could deal with. Yeah, I hear you. Jazz still terrifies me. <laughs> I love it. It's so I love much jazz, respect. Right? So yeah. much respect for jazz musicians for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll have to unearth one of those photos of <laughs> your dreadlocks <laughs> to lead for this for this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Every everyone who I ever say that to, and I can't believe I've actually said that <laughs> on a medium that more people might hear. But yeah, everyone who I mention that to asks the same question and mm. There are photos in existence. Am I going to show anyone? I'm sorry, no. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> I have Fair. to pay my parents some money, I think. Yeah, yeah. There are certainly photos of me that I hope <laughs> yeah. that go no further than they have gone. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So you've had this realization of, of the music industry and you want to be closer, at least in understanding the business side of it, but to pair that with your technical understanding of how music works and some of the tools that... that that go into facilitating recorded music. So what happened after that? How did you start pursuing that path? And 
that education and how did that culminate as a next step in your career? Yeah, sure. As I say, I was, I think is quite lucky, like very fortunate to be able to, as what was more or less my first ever role to work at one of the biggest most recognizable brands in music. Mm. That was a career defining moment for me, Abbey Road, that is. And I got on with them. I got on with my manager at that time, Simon Campbell, really well. And I've got a huge amount of respect for Simon. And ended up staying during that placement year for a little bit longer than I should have, maybe for 16, 17 months. I was helping out closing out Olympic. And so I built a really good relationship with those guys. When I graduated, I did take a little bit of time out. I did some long distance cycling through Europe and mm. enjoyed a period of time there. And then as it came around to, as I came around to the realization that I needed to start earning some money, move out of my parents' house, etc., a job came up at Abbey Road in what is called the audio products department. Mm. And that's the team, the department responsible for all of the software and hardware products which carry the abbey road name so that's sampled instruments plugins some hardware recreations and then a few adjacent products there have been i don't think i'm saying anything that i shouldn't say but there have been explorations into the automotive audio sector and hmm. so i was involved in a lot of those kind of conversations and those kind of development and management of those products I worked into a guy called Mirek Styles, who still is at Abbey Road. And again, huge amount of respect for Mirek, and I owe him a lot. But when I joined that team, it was going through a transition phase away from a model of let's develop these products ourselves effectively by contracting a freelance developer and marketing them through our own channels. It was, the department was moving from that model to a effectively a licensing model. Yeah. licensing out the brand and the intellectual property involved out to companies like Waves and Native Instruments. And that happened within the first year or two of me being there. And that was another quite significant chain of events for me because it left me with a bit more spare time, quite truthfully. And I'm a fairly motivated kind of guy. And I don't like downtime. <laughs> I don't really like sitting on the sofa and not achieving anything. And that's not a matter of pride. That's just how I'm wired. I'd love to be able to switch off in that way. But anyway, it left me with a bit more spare time. And I started wriggling around and exploring what I could do inside the building. And yeah, I started building a relationship with a systems developer at Abbey Road called James Clark who at the time, this was, wow, probably 2012, 2013, something like that. He was working on source separation technologies, mm. which now have become a lot more, I don't know, mainstreams the word, but more generally understood. Back then, the idea of unmixing audio was, to most people, and this is to, to most of the engineers at Abbey Road and most of us there, it seemed like a very distant, uh, unrealistic possibility. The idea of being able to pick apart a mono file into its constituent parts just felt unachievable. We've come a long way since then. Various versions of the machine learning have been applied to that problem. But back then, it was a different suite of technologies that James was using. But I saw him working away largely in his own time because he was just a curious mind working on that that problem, like how do you unmix audio? And he and I built a strong relationship and through me trying to figure out how to help him move more quickly and really me trying to figure out how to help him compete with others working on the same, the same kind of problem. And as I came to understand, that's people working in an academic capacity, people working in corporate innovation teams, people working in their bedrooms, and so on. And that was through me trying to figure out how to help him and how the how his competitors were being funded and how they were operating, that, that's what got me interested in this big question of where does new stuff come from? Hmm. Who works on it? 
who funds it, what drives them, and yeah, what does that bleeding edge really look like on the ground? And I, I was like I say, fairly technically minded at that point. Mm. I was commercially very naive, and I didn't know any of the stuff that I know now about incubators and VC funds and public funding, mm. philanthropic funding, all this stuff. And I went on a journey of discovery to try and figure it out in this spare time that had opened up for me. And I was very lucky, actually, that another key thing happened during that period. I was starting to get a little bit frustrated because I was working away on this, but I wasn't seeing the opportunity to turn my quest into anything significant at the studios. I didn't see a job role opening up mm. at that point around understanding innovation and driving innovation but thankfully around the same time and it wasn't great for everyone involved but there was a management management team switch around the end of 2013 yeah. because universal music had bought emi which previously owned abbey road it had bought out emi and therefore became the owner so this is universal music They'd left it alone for a while, left Abbey Road alone for a while, but then they decided to switch out the managing director and a lady named Isabel Garvey took over. And for everyone in the business, it was a kind of a moment of nervousness. But I fairly quickly built what I think was a really strong relationship with Isabel. And she's another person I've got a huge amount of respect for and I owe a lot to. And she saw my quest, my kind of naive quest into this new, brave new world of innovation and whatnot, and said, well, yeah, I kind of see what you're doing here. I don't think you're going about it quite the right way, but I love your energy, et cetera. She said, look, I'll give you a bit of time. Um, here's a bit of a budget. Go out to some events, go to some conferences, try and figure it out. And at that point in time, I was mainly speaking to academics. I was going to places like Queen Mary University in London. who have got a huge audio research, postdoctorate research center. And yes, yeah, Salford University are experts in acoustics and building relationships with those guys and trying to put in bids for public funding. So H2020 out of the e EU, um, the European Commission, and Innovate UK out of the UK, etc. And Isabel said, look, that's all good, but it's a bit too slow for us. What about startups? Hmm. What about the whole world around entrepreneurs? And it, it, I feel, again, incredibly naive now, given <laughs> that I really knew nothing about the whole ecosystem back then. But I dived in and went to TechCrunch Disrupt and started reading Mashable and all this stuff and started going to Techstars demo days and whatnot. And this was maybe the tail end of the glory days for that kind of ecosystem. It, it had matured quite a, long to, a lot by that point, by the point I got involved. It wasn't the kind of late 20, late 2000s, early 2010s, where the energy was super high and it was all still super new. But it was still fascinating and high octane. And I've completely fell in love with the energy of that whole space. And sure, there, there, was, there are a lot of criticisms of the culture around startups. And a lot of them are due. They're all fingers rightly pointed. But as much as you can criticize a lot of the behaviors and the output of some of the, the development of startups and whatnot, the, the culture of optimism is something to be cherished and something to be fostered. And I completely fell in love with that. So <clears throat> I got persuaded or got drawn towards entrepreneurs and startups more so than, say, hardcore academic funded R&D. That's what I wanted to do initially, but got drawn towards startups. And all of this came together in, in really Isabel and I, with the support of lots of other people, Mirak and others, um, deciding to launch or tiptoe into launching a department, and we called that Abbey Road Red. That quickly became the name for the incubation program, which is what we decided to go to market with. And I didn't know what an incubator was, and <laughs> we designed an incubator. I certainly, I think Isabel understood but I felt like I designed an incubator without knowing what one was and doing things from base principles in that way is something that I 
really try and encourage everyone to do. But when I ran a very small business with my wife for a while in antiques vintage, we used to put on these events, completely different. I, when I did that, this is when I was about 21 or so, 2021. I had no idea how to keep books, like no idea of the basics of accounting and made the whole thing up. And it irritated my brain and, until I figured it out. I didn't learn it in books. I just overcame the frustration by just hardcore graft. And I feel like I've got a much better understanding of double entry bookkeeping and than I ever would have if I tried to learn it out of a book. That kind of frustration is the, the, the mother of learning. And yeah, the same thing happened in, in this portion of my life with designing out an incubator. It's like, how do we as a company, how do we support startups? How do we support entrepreneurs? What can we offer? And so we decided to go out with this. Will you give us a little piece of your company? We'll connect you through to all of the people that we know as a brand through Universal Music and Abbey Road. And it caught wind. It caught the wind. And I ended up being on BBC News and on TechCrunch and Radio 4 and all this stuff. And I hadn't been media trained. <laughs> I was far from being an expert in anything that I was being asked to talk about. <laughs> but I rapidly learned, absolutely loved it. And we, yeah, we launched this program and lots of people started applying. And it was amazing. Absolutely loved every second of it. I ended up running three and a bit cycles of the program they're six months long each and met thousands of people who are incredibly lucky that the abbey road business card was is was and is very powerful and i'll stop there because that's kind of the end <laughs> it's becoming the end of that chapter no that's amazing I, i'm curious to hear like a little bit more about about the incubator and what were some of the projects that 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 were incubating through Abbey Road Red, or some of the more memorable or more exciting projects to you. And yeah. at this point, starting to glean some of the ills of the industry and hmm. seeing these people trying to, like, trying to fix shit. Yeah. It was... As much as I, in an, uh, an, as I said at an earlier point, was driven to understand... The, the forces or the problems. Dur during this phase, I was more being driven by curiosity of about the future. Another thing to say is that I started work during that period in the middle, I started work on an iPad application, fairly early days of iPads, and was given a relatively small budget to work on an iPad app that the studios would publish. Plotted timeline of the studio's history, a kind of book, an interactive book, and I... Looking back on it, I massively overcomplicated things and <laughs> fell into every pitfall that you shouldn't fall into as a digital product manager. But the one lasting legacy that I left behind on that project, because it never actually got released, was that I, I started to catalog the history of Abbey Road in this database that I actually worked with that guy, James Clark, the systems developer on, and, and structured photographic artifacts and stories and moments in time in this big long database and through doing that I became a kind of archivist and I became a historian I was a journalist not but not really but looking into the real plotted history of the studios which went all the way back to the turn of the century so into the 20th century and even right back to the beginnings the birth of recording and the first scratches of audio signals onto wax and so I had this plotted history and I know I'm really proud of the amount I know about the history of the audio technologies. And so the, what was driving me in the areas that I was interested in was the kind of extrapolation forward into the future. It wasn't necessarily what problems can we fix or what problems do I feel like uh, I should be fixing with innovation for the business. It was more what's happening, what's cool, what do we need to jump on board with? And so the things that fascinated me at that time were around music information retrieval. So that's audio listening. How do you extract metadata from an audio file? That tied in with how do you then learn from that data? How do you use machine learning to build autonomous systems based on some of that data? 
and what can those systems do? Separately from that, I was fascinated by 3D spatial audio, especially because virtual reality was becoming quite significant at that time. Facebook had bought Oculus and the whole game development world started to be imported into a first person kind of environment in headset. But then if you're in that environment, you want the audio to match. And so spatial audio became a hot topic. I would, I'm sure probably quite a few other areas that I'm just forgetting right now, but it was, it was around those two topics we started to focus. And uh, yeah, two of the companies that I'm most, I tend to find myself speaking about the most that actually fit into those categories. So there was one company called OSIC that we supported who I absolutely loved. They were building this pair of very complex headphones that were an equivalent really of a VR headset for your ears. The guys running the company had a lot of experience. They they were at Ultimate Ears, which was owned by Logitech, had built a huge consumer brand there and were really well placed to get this right. They launched a very successful Kickstarter campaign. It was in the top 50 campaigns of all time. And um, Abbey Road played some part in that. But I had the experience of being with them on the journey, which was amazing. And I have a huge amount of respect for them. In the end, that one didn't work. They weren't able to raise a Series A round. And the company ended up actually closing. And they never shipped to their Kickstarter backers. So that was a highly controversial project in now, at least, to have worked on. And yeah, there were a lot of annoyed Kickstarter backers. Yeah, I imagine. Um, but I, yeah, I really enjoyed that one. So that one didn't go so well. That one went south. <laughs> but then the one that fits in with the audio information retrieval and machine learning strand was a company called AI Music, led by a guy called Siavash Madhavi. And yeah, absolutely loved working with those guys as well. And Sivash is an incredibly intelligent guy. Had already started and sold one AI um, centered business, which is around generative design, 3D design, building 3D models for yeah, various different applications like structural components or trainers and super smart. And he started employing the same his brains and some of the same approaches to, to music and some problems around music, they ended up being, and I still don't know whether it's ever been officially announced, but it's all over the internet. They ended up being acquired by Apple. And so he, he now works for Apple. So that was a success story for sure. And then there are various other companies. I can't n- name everyone, but yeah, other, others that I absolutely loved working with, like a guy called George Wright, who runs a company called Voclia. It's, he actually became a member of the Rattle after being a participant in Abbey Road Red. And what he developed was a, and you can find this all online, it's a very successful product now, a microphone, but really with a piece of software that would learn the idiosyncrasies of how you mimic a instrument and then do a kind of more compli- complex or adaptive version of audio to MIDI. I've described that really badly, but you could effectively hum a guitar line and what you'd get out the other end is a as a guitar riff. I don't know if they use this line anymore, but George, back then when I was working closely with him, used the uh, the one-liner of the voice is the only instrument you've been learning since birth. So most people can beatbox a rudimentary drum line and, or hum a, hum a trumpet melody, but very few people can play the drums or play the trumpet. And so it opens up the joy of creation to lots of people. So really broad spectrum of super interesting stuff that I got the chance to work on during that phase. And uh, yeah, still look back on that time with real fondness. Cool. Yeah. And then I'm curious to hear what led to your transition from Abbey Road to to the Rattle, another space that became an incubator for projects and a place where a lot of this innovation was being explored. What did that transition look like for you? Yeah, sure. It was, it was really, it was that, well, I got a chance to meet, like I said, thousands of people and I'm incredibly grateful for that. One of the people that I met was Chris Howard, who's my co-founder in the battle. And 
I can't remember exactly how it happens. I think it happened. I think he t- tells the story as he sent me a LinkedIn message and then I ignored him apparently to start <laughs> with. He got the feeling of just being another person trying to muscle their way in, into Abbey Road. But he persisted and I invited him in for a coffee and he made an impression on me like he does with most people. <laughs> and he always stood out as someone that I felt I should maintain a relationship with. And he won't mind me saying that he's a, a divisive character. He's <laughs> in, incredibly smart. And he's really one of the brightest people, most productive people I know. But those people who are that way inclined also divide opinion. And so I, I remember that about Chris. And he won't mind me saying all that because lots of people say that. But I, <laughs> I, took, I took a couple of the companies that we were supporting through Abbey Road Red to see Chris for various different pieces of advice. And he always gave really cutting, really on point, really useful advice and high value advice. And so we just kept a relationship and he was between the longer term projects around that time. He was entrepreneur in residence at Techstars in London. He was doing some lecturing at, I think... UCL on entrepreneurship and so some different projects but was cooking up a new business which had no name had really no structure at that point with a guy called Bobby Bloomfield and that was the rattle it didn't have a name back then but because Chris and I had formed a close relationship I stayed close to that and I was invited along to various different things they were hosting in the early days and watched them pitch and Started to, because I liked the sound of what they were building, it was formless really still at that point. I started offering a bit of support and made some introductions for them. And I actually tried to to encourage, well, I did encourage, but tried to get the rattle to apply to join Abbey Road Red. As a young startup, I was like, we can maybe help you guys. And Chris is a very experienced entrepreneur. He's run companies himself. He's supported other people. And he's also run a an incubator himself as well and been involved in textiles etc so he didn't feel like he needed the structure of abbey road red and said i don't think this is for us and i respect that but all of that meant i was very close to their journey and it was actually just as well they bobby and chris managed to raise a pre-seed round off of really what was just a deck and some desk research and it wasn't until they'd raised that money that we started having conversations about whether there might be a fit for me to join the team. I'd actually already, and I don't know if I've told Chris this or Bobby this, but I had actually already started thinking about it separately. I thought maybe I could approach those guys. It sounds interesting. And I absolutely loved Abbey Road and still do. And I could have stayed there a very long time and probably would still be happy there. But I had this kind of startup itch. Like I said, I'd done a very small thing with my wife. I'd done a couple of other things tried to manage a couple of artists and done a very bad job, bad job, tried to release some music with, <laughs> with a friend on behalf of other people, done a bad job of that. And I still, I had this itch that I really wanted to be involved in starting a company and I've been looking around for an opportunity and the writer came along and thought, you know what, maybe that's the one because, and this is no criticism really of Universal or Abbey Road, but I'd started to reach the limits of what it seemed like I was able to achieve there. I wanted to scale up Abbey Road Red into into Universal and run it more broadly or up even into their parent company. But we were having those conversations, but I felt like it it was moving a bit more slowly than I wanted my life to progress. And that's really that seems to be the main reason why people leave companies is it's a lack of alignment of speed. And I saw Chris and Bobby coming out the blocks and I thought, wow, to they they seem to be wanting to do a lot of the things that I want to do here and with the autonomy and the freedom and the backing to kind of venture backing to do it. And so saw it as an, as an opportunity to see through some of my ideas, starting a seed fund or running a space or doing the same kind of incubation and venture building with a broader range of people like artists and et cetera. So one thing led to another and Chris and I got drunk one one time and ended up awkwardly having the conversation and that set the wheels in motion and originally I was joining as an employee to run the London space as the director 
but that quickly turned into do you know what John I think the sort of the amount they bring to the business and the kind of impact you're likely to have feels more like a co-founder type position and so they were very gracious in inviting me in as a as a late joining co-founder and you know give me a portion of the company to reflect that vesting and everything else and um, and so we went so I would never call myself a original founder of the rattle that title does not I'm not deserving of that but was there fairly early and certainly feel very much like a co-founder now. Cool. Yeah, I'm curious. The rattle has always been fascinating to me because of because of the ambition and the energy to try to to try to take on a lot of different aspects and bring them into into this realm of the rattle. And I'll let you speak to that a little bit more, but I'm curious just to hear the progression as after you joined to the point at which we connected, you know, a few sure. months ago and talking about for the piece that was also on Decentral and talking about your trajectory from that to thinking about tokenization as an opportunity and just your introduction to Web3 and hearing how your mind was starting to think about that within the context of the rattle. Yeah, for sure. Likewise, it's always difficult but really interesting for me to go back through the history of the rattle and it's been coming up to five years now so those conversations I was describing that I was having with Chris that was around the end of 2017 so yeah coming up for five years since that point and like a lot of companies the rattle has twisted and a lot of early stage companies the rattle's twisted and turned multiple times and that is a point of pride. Is a we've done it out of necessity. But we're also proud of the fact we've adapted and shifted really quickly as and when necessary. And but what that means is every time I step back through, I, I remind myself of oh yeah, wow, we did try and do that thing, or wow, that yeah, that idea that got shelved, or blah, blah, blah. but to try and give the abridged version, the rattle opened in early 2018 as a physical people would use the word hub it's a cringy corporate word but <laughs> hub for generally speaking what we came to call founders we we've never managed to find an appropriate word to tie together the disparate sort of categories of people that we think all share a common set of behavioral traits and common set of ambitions but founders the best we've managed to do some people would say entrepreneur some people might say inventor some people some might say creator but we've created this hub for these people that were trying to make something new so release music and change the world in some way through their art to communicate something or people that had invented something a fundamental idea that they were they were developing but there's a real melting pot, another horrible cringe word that people in boardrooms use, but a <laughs> yeah, fizzing mess of interesting people. And we <laughs> we have always, this is still true, we've always tried to base what we do on the human sciences, if you will, social sciences. We've always tried to base our decision making in research from the field of psychology and sociology and that comes a lot from Chris's influence but also from my interests in yeah behavioral economics and some of the more popular texts from the social sciences and have since become fascinated by yeah the writings of Richard Dunbar and etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. so what we started doing fairly on was trying to be deliberate about engineering community. And so within that chaos of different people, we were trying to create moments that created, and we became obsessed by trust and serendipity being those kind of unexpected moments that happen when you, oftentimes in a sharing a physical space, but yeah, sharing space with others, communing and exploring ideas and, and trust being the out, really the outcome of this often built through some kind of shared agent and the kind of a commonality through some agent and the, the rattle in this case being the agent. 
So two two people or more say, we're both members of the battle, therefore we can trust each other, let's do something together based off of a serendipitous moment. So that and other other base principles we, uh, fed into us, us trying to be very deliberate around creating a culture, creating a, a, an environment that, that created best opportunities for those who had chosen to join. And we were very selective, n- never sure whether or not saying the number of applications we've received is a point of point we should be proud of or not. But we certainly were very selective in, we ended up accepting about 5% of all applicants because we wanted a certain type of person working on a certain type of thing and we wanted to maintain a culture. And, uh, but then, and here's the kind of rub, the thing that became quite influential across the first year or so at the Rattle. Because we were curating, there was one force there which was acting quite counter to our, ne- our need to make money to turn revenue. Because our, mm. our business model during, during that phase was charging members to be members. And that carried on for quite a long time until fairly recently. But the desire to curate, but the need to make revenue, were always opposing forces. Because as you can see, we always struggle with, well, do we just soften our curation a little bit to increase revenue or do we not worry about revenue? And, and then that, plus also an internal debate around the rat wanting to ultimately be meritocratic or wanting to be at all a thing that only those who could afford it were able to gain access to. So during the first year, there was a lot of internal conversation around how do we make this, how do we, how do we resolve that tension? And also how do we try and how do we move to make this thing free all the while having cash needs and et cetera. So we, that was all waiting to be resolved in the background, but things were going and we were growing and people were responding well and people were enjoying and they were sticking around and more people were applying to join. So toward the end of 2018, we decided to raise more money. We were doing decent revenue at that point, but it wasn't covering all our overheads. We were a, relatively speaking, slightly bloated team because we were still in startup iteration R&D mode wasting a lot of money because we were just exploring so we decided to raise more money and with that money we said we were going to do two things one was open a, a another site and also explore other ways to engage with members and that became our venture building and i'll, I'll come on to that but we ended up raising about 1.1 million pounds so about 1.5 million dollars which added to the half a million dollars from the first round, taking us up to, to about two million. And uh, yeah, we committed some of that money to a US business. We incorporated in the US. We sorted out visas. We, yeah, that was a whole learning experience for me. I know a lot about doing business in California now, which is something I thought I'd never know about. But <laughs> I'm grateful for that. But that so we spent a lot of money on that. And we launched the LA business on the same model. You applied to join. You are, you're then part of a curated, deliberately fostered community and you get to enjoy the space and the facilities that we built, the studio and production facilities. But all the while we started exploring this idea of, well, if, how about if someone stops paying us, how can we work with them in a different way that means that we're sharing value? And we didn't want to become a record label. We didn't want to become a management company, so we didn't want to share in revenue. We didn't want to sh- we didn't want to take rights because those things are done already. We didn't want to iterate and incrementally improve those things. We wanted to really dramatically shift things up. And because Chris very much and I, less had come from the startup world where equity is the means of engagement, we thought, why don't we start to employ equity as the way that we work with some members? So. We started to pilot that in early 2019, this was, and said, you stop paying us, but you incorporate. So you you start a vehicle that has some shares, a limited company in the UK, this is, and you give us a portion of those shares over time in some configuration, and we support you. And therefore, if that operation, if that limited company starts making money, either we as a shareholder take a dividend, if that's ever distributed, or if that company becomes acquired or there's some liquidation event in the future, we get a payout like a typical shareholder would. Now that, that kind of 
relationship is very common across most areas of business, but just completely uncommon in music. So we tried it and we managed to make it work. And we helped one member in London raise a seed round in, into that limited company that he'd started. And so we thought, wow, this seems to be working. Maybe there's something in this for us. And so that that became the beginning of everything else from there on. We effectively, around the middle of 2019, turned our backs on membership revenue being our source of cash or capital to, to run our operations and decided instead what we want to become, I think we want to become long-term investors and build a portfolio of equity positions in, yeah, tech businesses, which I often negate to mention, but also artists. And that's what we became known for quite a while, was really exploring and maybe pioneering even this model of, can you support an artist in the same way that you support a early stage tech entrepreneur? Can you form the same kind of relationship and treat them like a founder? And there's a huge amount to be said about that, but that became the next phase. But I'll pause there in, in case you've got any questions on that. Oh, no, it was brilliant. Thank you. I'm excited to, to hear about the next phase because I, I think early on in our conversations, we were talking a lot about how a token fits within yeah. that and can, can potentially support it. And I feel like the rattle was exploring a lot of ideas that just in, in what you were doing to engineer community that have become commonplace now within a lot of yeah. you know, web three organizations being connected in more of like collective governance structures and trying to build trust in novel ways. So yeah, I'm keen to hear more. Yeah. And I guess I've accidentally already said a lot of stuff that I'm probably gonna be able to tie in here, but <laughs> yeah, we, we, at that point, we're very much still thinking about equity. And so this is from both sides. We were looking to sell equity in the rattle as a way to raise money to keep going. Also looking to take equity as a means of engagement and long-term security, securing our interest in the projects we were working on. Throughout 2019, I was a fairly late entrant into the world of tokens and cryptography and whatnot and like everyone else uh, the kind of passing interest and i bought a little bit of bitcoin and everything else but really didn't start paying attention until honestly embarrassingly late probably around uh, we're going to mid 2020 late 2020 maybe yeah yeah probably late 20, 2020 really when i started to pay attention I regret that. I really think that I and the Rattle should have paid a lot more attention through uh, through earlier parts of the development of yeah, tokenization and whatnot. Because, and the reason I say that is because while we were fixated on equity, the whole, especially creator community, was starting to wake up to tokenization. Now, in one sense, the two are very similar. If you use tokens in a particular way, they start to look a lot like shares. Obviously, it depends how you use a token, how you deploy the token, what agreements you form around those tokens, etc. But we were banging the drum of, yeah, we share long-term interest in your business through equity and having a really tough time pitching that to artists who are anti-VC and anti-the man and being glib and, <laughs> and talking in broad strokes. But there was a real feeling of, this all sounds like tech bro speak, but over here, there's this growing artist first adoption of, of tokens and everything else. And we should have switched over a lot sooner. That, that is a regret of mine. Um, but uh, yeah, what we inadvertently had been doing was exploring some very similar themes, like you say, community, alternative forms of investment and ownership. Yeah, f uh, through different things, projects we've been doing, uh, alternative forms of cutting in community and giving them some for form of governance rights and giving, starting to give our community a bit more of a say. I'd actually, before I really woke up to decentralized communities, I'd really started to go deep into cooperative structures. And that actually put me on a whole, this is during the lockdown period when I started to run long distances, I went on a Chomsky binge and started consuming as much of his writing as I could as a way to understand, again, some base principles and some of the underpinnings around social movements like cooperatives and, and whatnot. And so I've really 
going hard on some of these topics, but all the while just completely ignorant to decentralization. And again, I feel so stupid and naive for not <laughs> switching over so, uh, soon enough. But yeah, we when we finally came around to it, we are like, wow, we're really well placed to now embrace tokens in, in some form, either through, either, either to use tokens in our own community to create some kind of DAO structure or as a form of security when working with member projects or as a way to raise capital for our business or a way to engage with our mentor community. So all these applications started to have reveal themselves to us. And we thought, wow, let's, this feels, we were very bullish and still are bullish on, on the future of crypto, but different parts of it more so than others. But yeah, we thought, you know what, we're all about innovation. We're all about the future, we're all about doing stuff differently, pioneering new lines of thought. We'd be idiots to just not give something a go. And we started exploring lots of things in tandem. One thing, which is something we still very much intend to do at some point, still firmly on our roadmap is, I shouldn't commit to that actually, but we really <laughs> like the idea of creating some kind of tokenized fund. It's problematic, legally problematic, but we've spent a decent amount of money on lawyers and we've done a lot of our own research into the various rules in different jurisdictions. But the way that we'd want to deploy that is we'd want to create some kind of tokenized vehicle that owns the, the interests that we have in the projects that we've supported, be they tokenized projects that we own some tokens in or in corporations that we own some kind of share capital in or any shares in. And so that tokenized vehicle that owns those positions would then be highly liquid or the kind of interest in that vehicle would be highly liquid and could there be therefore be traded on some kind of exchange potentially to act like a kind of public investment fund of some kind. There's a huge amount to be explored around there. I've used the wrong language accidentally in different points there, but <laughs> hopefully that paints a picture of the kind of domain that we're looking to explore over time. But the, we have to get that right and we have to spend a lot of money on that. And so one of the things we did in the short term was all the while we're not able to issue a security token without some real head headaches, why don't we issue another form of token that achieves something fairly similar, uh, but that isn't a security? Maybe has the option to be exchanged for a security token in the future, but has utility in its own right. And so we launched this project, I guess you'd call it, a new arm of the Rattle called the Rattle Society, which was our way or is our way of engaging with a different community of, of backer. So not an investor, we have investors, so shareholders who've put in money. We have members who are people that we support, but the Rat Society was and is a way for us to engage with a community of people that show up, I guess, partly philanthropically, but definitely their purchase of a token is not a gift. But there's an element of, yeah, do you know what? I'm here because I want to support those people. I want to support those artists, those pioneering people. I want to be here for that. But they also show up because they want their token to maintain long-term value and they want it to track as the rattle continues to grow and better projects are, in, not better, but more and more, in, more projects are incubated and those projects go on to do better things and scale. And they want to be able to trade out that position Etc. And that's, I don't need to explain all that stuff. This is a this is going out to a community of people that really understand. But we thought, you know what, this that feels like a really good fit. We didn't want to tokenize our community of members at a point. We didn't think it was the right time to fully tokenize the rattle from a sort of stakeholder shareholder perspective. We thought that feels like the right thing to do at that point. And we launched the Rattle Society in I think it was around May time. I can't remember exactly. And uh, it was more successful than we thought it would be. And people really did show up and they responded really well. And there, we didn't appeal to a portion of the token buying community that 
wants to see high rap, like rapid growth, the kind of PFP crowds. That wasn't and isn't what we're doing. But we were we seemed to gain a lot of respect from people that were a little bit tired even at that point of those kind of projects launching and doing what they do and saw what we were pitching as a much more stable and sensible use of token technology. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm biased because I that's how I felt about it, but that, that seemed to be the way that we were received. We we didn't get we didn't have the chance, we chose not to, but we didn't have the chance to run it for long enough to really sell lots. We just did a one one week flash sale. We sold enough to feel confident that there's something in it and we fully plan to sell more tokens at some point. But it was another experiment in the long line of experiments that the rattle's done in exploring the best way to support the people that we really care about which is members those artists those inventors those pioneers and um and so who knows where that's going to go next whether we do create this tokenized fund or we keep selling rattle society tokens or we raise more money through equity or we smush it all together but it feels like crypto is a fairly long term now cornerstone of what the rattles from a technological and philosophical perspective going to be based on cool oh it's amazing and at that time when you were thinking about transitioning and this came after some conversations we'd had about just the exploration and all of the legal gray areas that that still exist and make this very complex to implement whether something counts as, as a security or not and yep. you know actually using the howey test and determining if something has enough utility to to transcend the security. And it, it's, I mean, there's a lot still that needs to be determined. But I'm curious at this point, now that it's been a few months uh, since that initial experiment, where you experienced some success and have understood this as a new direction in which you can continue to push over the past few months, if you can talk about any of the insights that, that you've started to cultivate and you're try to build in certain directions, anything that you're able to share about what's happening now and where your head's at the moment. Yeah. Again, I, uh, this is one of those, I wish there was a super romantic, compelling answer to it. <laughs> um, I, I, there, during that phase where we were speaking quite regularly, this was, all of these topics were front and center. I was highly immersed. And I haven't had the opportunity to be that engaged with all those topics since that point, I've unfortunately had to go back to some more of the day-to-day -the -day of running the rattle. And so a lot of my opinions and perspectives of, it's not that they haven't developed at all, but they've been somewhat frozen from yeah, around summertime. And uh, that's just through, through necessity. We, I'd love a life where I'm incredibly jealous of Sherry Who. I'm kind of intellectually <laughs> jealous. Uh, an intellectual crush on on Sherry, <laughs> and I've I've had the sort of privilege of knowing her for a fair amount of time. And the reason I'm jealous is because she has the space. Seemingly, I don't know how she does it, but has the space to constantly stay abreast of and on top of contemporary conversation around all these topics and. I used to have that back at Abbey Road a bit more than I do right now because right now I have to run the operation. I'm loftily called the CRO of the rattle. And for that, uh, day to day, that means I'm liaising with accountants and lawyers and sorting out payroll and hiring and firing and all, all that kind of day to day. And it's not that I don't enjoy that. I do, I love it. But I do miss being able to stare into the distance and stroke my chin and <laughs> and really contemplate and gain an understanding of form opinions on 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 topics and i'm a as i said to you just before uh, offline i'm an avid podcast listener and i spend a lot of time with lex friedman's podcast and that's my guilty pleasure my intellectual guilty pleasure when i'm out running and training and listening to Lex and the people he interviews that's where I get that kick that kind of st intellectual stimulation but day to day recently I've honestly just been buried so far in the detail of the rattle that I've annoyingly not not 
had the chance to develop some of my thinking. But as I say, I'm still bullish. The thing I didn't say is that we launched that NFT project the same week that crypto fell off a cliff, which was, we watched it unravel in real time, just across. And then, I don't know what the rattle did in a previous life. We have had a string of very bad luck. <laughs> the thing that I didn't mention is when we launched the Los Angeles space, we launched it on the 9th of March, 2020. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was the Monday. The Friday, Trump moved to close the borders. And we had to get basically the last flight out of, out of California, out of Los Angeles, through Barcelona, being frog marched through the airport by people with guns. And wild. We'd, we, that's, they're just two examples of how the timing just could not have been worse. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the uh, even though crypto is, has fallen off a cliff and stagnated since, that's just a crisis of confidence and whatever else. It doesn't change the fact that the from a technological perspective, tokens can be used for some very interesting things. And that, that's what I'm still bullish on. Yeah, for me personally, this has been, I'm not sure if it's because I'm at this point more steeped in it than ever, but it's been the most exciting period of growth and innovation that I've yeah. seen within the space, just because I think a lot of the hype left web three alone yeah. to, to go do its thing and keep building and that's that's what happened after the ico craze as well yeah. all of the speculators left and now people are building to build a sustainable foundation for this next version of the internet are still here and actually have the space to to do it yeah and you're undoubtedly more connected in and would have a much better read on the sentiment in in the communities of people building and innovating as you say but i'm imagining that and i'm connected in some ways but i'm imagining there is an element of relief that the, uh, the dominant narrative isn't one of pump and dumps and high growth and what like you say what is left behind is a community of believers that are in this for the long term and can just get down to work and uh, in the near future that will be us again once we've yeah once i've got the ability to lift myself back out of some of the detail but uh, yeah i can see why that would be the case the kind of calm period of okay let's let's just let's really explore now absolutely yeah and i'm excited to see how the rattle continues to explore this still nascent still nascent ecosystem and it seems like a good point to transition into one more question for you which i like to ask people not to put you on the spot, but I'll put you on the spot a little bit. You're going to a desert island. You get to bring three albums with you. Which ones do you bring? Oh, wow. Don't overthink it too much, whatever comes oh, in first. Oh, man. <laughs> I say this. As someone who's spent their life in music, I feel like I've earned the right to be able to make jokes like this, but <laughs> fallen out of love with music a little bit recently. <laughs> um, but that, that's seasonal for me. I There will be a time where I am a track will really catch my attention and move me again and reignite my passion. It's not that I'm, I can't stand the sound of music, <laughs> but uh, I'm not at that point where I'm as avidly hunting, but I'm going to cop out and say, it's probably I'd take something relatively functional. That's another trend that is something that I was really interested in way back when I was talking about the technologies and the things that I was interested in. I'm, I'm still am really interested in functional music that has the ability to put you in a cognitive state or cr put you in in a state that's optimal for a certain task. And I'm really interested in how autonomous systems are going to play into that. So you've got things like Endel, which is super interesting, endless generative soundtracks that make you or help you fall asleep or put you in a focused mood, etc. And then you've got things like wave paths, which they're a company developing a kind of a generative audio accompaniment to psychedelic therapy. So I'm really interested in those kind of functional uses of music. So I'd probably pick something that has that kind of functional effect on me. So something fairly ambient. There's an Alva Noto and Ryuichi Sakamoto, I think it is, uh, album called Insen, which I absolutely love. It's slightly challenging, slightly noisy, glitchy music, but it's perfect to to work to and then catches your attention. There's one track on there called Berlin, which 
got me through my dissertation <laughs> at university. Nice. It's really phenomenal. So I'd definitely take that. I'd probably go for something fairly similar. So around the time I similar in function, not in form, but I really had a Penguin Cafe Orchestra moment oh, nice. for a while. Nice. And had the chance to see I can't remember the his son's name, but his son took over the orchestra and I got to see them perform a couple of times. Once at Glastonbury, actually, it was just really amazing. Nice. So I take a Penguin Cafe Orchestra album, I think, and uh, a third one. What do I pick? Kind of something more of a guilty pleasure that I probably shouldn't admit that I love, but I no. do. Something to put me in a good mood, like a, an upbeat Scandi disco, like a... Or I was going to say a Todd Terge, yes, uh, a, a Lindstrom or so, something, <laughs> that, that kind of sound, just for when I need to uh, <laughs> stop working and actually try and have a bit of fun in the evening and have a one-man one man party. <laughs> nice, good answers. Yeah, and if in terms of the functional music, if you've never listened to music for 18 musicians as like a way to really stay, stay in tune and stay in the zone, it's pretty effective as well. Gotcha. I'll check it out. Cool. Cool, John. Great chatting as always. Thanks so much for taking the time. I hope everything continues to keep rolling the rattle and keep innovating and keep doing good things for music and the communities building building around it. Yeah, I really appreciate the uh, the invite and likewise love our conversations and look forward to many more. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye. And that's a wrap on this episode of Big Brother and the Hodling Company, which is produced by Matt Solon, with music courtesy of Brian Duncan and Kareem Iams. Thanks for being here, and see you next time.